Uh, I am an artist, uh, and uh, I am not a curator. I am a, uh, an educator. I do work in a museum and have worked in a museum for 20 years. But um, somehow I see my practice as museum educator and artist interrelated. Um, when, uh, when I was invited to, to present here, uh, it, it, it was really quite a challenge to really think about such a large and heavy question as to can we change the world. Um, I think that uh, um, this question does appear uh, amongst the practice of some of us who have been working on socially engaged art because um, in a way what we produce are projects that are, um, I guess, hopeful, uh, that are trying to be uh, proposals for, for better ways of, of, of living. And, uh, and I think because there are responses to mainly what, what I think happened in the 90s, which was the rise of, of relational art, and yet a kind of art that even though it, it, it uh, invited participation, uh, it still lacked a certain kind of uh, weight to it, or what, 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 the, what this participation actually meant. Uh, what was really the difference between a symbolic participation and a, and a long-lasting uh, experience that would actually have a, a, a more uh, definite effect on, on the way of acting and thinking of a particular social group. So um, I will discuss a, a particular example of a project that I did um, connected to this. It, uh, it was a radio station in the city of Bologna. Uh, but first I will tell you a little bit about uh, what do I think when I think about projects like this? What are the things that are important to me? Coming from education, um, there, are, there are two things that are, that, are, that are important to me. One of them is the uh, the, the structure of, uh, uh, of interactions, the, 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 the presenting a, uh, a, uh, a project that can, um, uh, can be, rec that proposes a kind of interaction that is recognizable uh, to the participant. So I'm very interested in working uh, from existing uh, uh, social structures that, that, uh, that, the, that have very clear roles for the participants, whether it's a school, whether it's a, a, a museum environment, uh, or whether it's a, um, a, a particular collaborative structure. So I'm interested in that, and I'm also interested in how, as an artist, one can create a particular um, platform where uh, there is enough structure so that the so that the like the experience is is focused and definite, uh, but at the same time that there's enough freedom for the participant to bring their own experiences in that. So for that, I will just uh, talk very quickly about two projects that precede the one I'm going to talk about that that propose a similar uh, similar types of structures and that that have influential that have been influential in my thinking on on the one I'm mentioning now. Um, the, um, the School of Pan-American Unrest was one of my uh, early projects uh, that it was actually a 10-year project uh, reflecting on the nature of Pan-Americanism, uh, but really more, more specifically on what it really means to be a nation and how one constructs the whole idea of, uh, of a national identity. This was a, a project that, was, that really emerged from 9-11 and it really consist, consisted in creating an autonomous structure that uh, will be in the shape of a schoolhouse, uh, inside of which I will do activities, discussions, and the workshops connected to ideas of Pan-Americanism. Uh, having uh, local artists uh, uh, or anybody who was uh, just interested in it to, to write a collective statement uh, about the particular uh, situation in their, in their city and then create actions and performances uh, that, uh, that would reflect those, those interests. And the project was basically a, a road project that consisted in me driving from Alaska to Chile with this uh, structure uh, that we would set up in different uh, plazas uh, from, from the north to the south. Uh, and um, what was important was really, uh, for me, the, the, that, that interactive component of the, of the people really collectively writing this statement. Uh, but at the same time, showing that kind of autonomous structure uh, that was really the, the, the place under which its auspices we could produce the, the gesture. Uh, another example the, of another prior project of me that, that started, where I tried to articulate these, ways, these forms of participation was called Instituto de la Telenovela, Soap Opera Institute. Uh, it, uh, I'm from Mexico originally, and uh, in visiting Eastern Europe, I, I realized the extent to which the Latin American soap opera was influential in Eastern Europe, how people suddenly after the fall of Berlin Wall had become obsessed with Mexican soaps. Uh, so I decided to actually do a, uh, a nomadic uh, institute that included exhibitions, uh, performances, but mainly workshops and media literacy about the nature of the soap opera. Uh, what was really interesting in, the, in Eastern Europe was that people were uh, um, 
uh, very much reacting to the way in which the, the, dr the drama of the soaps really exposed uh, social and racial tensions within different countries. Um, so what we were trying to do with, this, with, this, with the institute was to create both an exhi a hybrid exhibition and social space uh, where people would come and talk about soaps. And what was interesting, for example, here in Zagreb, uh, me, women in, her, in their 50s were populating the Contemporary Art Center for the first time, excluding the performance artists and people who really kind of usually dominated the area. To me, this is an example of how you, know, you bring local knowledge and, and then uh, acquire new meaning by, by, by building on this structure. Uh, and um, so it, it was through these formats uh, of, uh, of discussion and, uh, and reflection that we'll, we will take one subject and then, and then uh, try to make it uh, adaptable to the particular location where the, where the, where the project was taking place. So um, that brings me to Aelia Media, which is really the project that I'm going to talk about. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to you, take you through my, uh, my thinking process in developing this project and uh, hopefully to communicate uh, what, was, uh, uh, what I was thinking and as, as it was elaborated. Um, so Aelia Media uh, was a project proposed for the city of Bologna in Italy. Um, and uh, if you have ever been to, to Bologna, uh, you might know that uh, I mean, it's, a, it's a wonderfully uh, culturally rich city, uh, very progressive. It's known as Bologna la Rosa, uh, Bologna the red one, uh, with a long history of socialism and, and communism with a, with a functional communist party uh, until very recently. Um, and uh, a place that since the 19th century had a, uh, a long tradition of, 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 uh, of cooperative societies, uh, what they called Societa de Mutuo Socorso, uh, um, the idea that, that everybody can help each other. Uh, so it was really ingrained in the, in the, in the culture of the region. Um, it also has uh, important, it's an important history of the, uh, uh, in the 20th century of, of, of education, uh, where the, the system Reggio Emilia, a preschool, a preschool system, one of the most influential of the 20th century was born there. Uh, which uh, aims at creating better citizens of the world. That interested me enormously as an educator. Uh, and also, um, it also the place where the oldest university of the world exists, uh, this is the University of Bologna, uh, created in 1000 AD. So a very rich and wealthy city. Um, uh, and I also had a student movement in the 70s. In 1977, uh, there was a movement uh, that kind of uh, challenged the generation of the 68, uh, which was then already seen as, as kind of uh, older, as seen as more, more restrictive. And there was kind of a confrontation between that old left and the younger left. And uh, the way that they really practiced their, their activities was through pirate radio. That was their medium of communication. Uh, and uh, the 77 generation of Bologna were, were very kind of uh, very different from the from the 68. They were much more. Um, they, they saw the 68 as too solemn and too serious, and too they, they would take themselves too seriously. And like this generation was much younger and much more radical, or they saw themselves more radical. Uh, they called themselves Indiani Metropolitani, uh, Metropolitan Indians, um, and. Um, and what happened was, uh, in 1980, there was a confrontation between the old left and the new left that resulted in, uh, in the city government um, uh, kind of trying to uh, um, end a, a student demonstration that ended in the killing uh, of, of one of the students. Um, from that point in the 80s, uh, Bologna had many ups and downs, and, uh, but the, the, the left started to fragment itself. And what happened, which was kind of very tragic for the eyes of the progressive Bolognese, was that a right-wing politician became mayor of, of Bologna. And the first thing that the mayor did was to put uh, things like religious statues in the middle of piazzas, which were the places where the, the students had originally demonstrated. You know, so the piazzas were very important in the student movement. So to put like these saints in the middle of the, of the piazza was a message by the right saying, piazzas are not for messing around, piazzas are for respect and for tradition and for commerce, of course. Um, <clears throat> so this is more or less a situation I encountered in Bologna uh, or I mean, uh, the history that I encountered in Bologna. And as you, if you know also Italian history, uh, Silvio Berlusconi had been in control. This is in 2010 when I was there. Um, and uh, Berlusconi's legacy is the one of somebody who has basically run uh, Italian media and at the same time run the Italian political scene. 
two very destructive things like when they come together. So not only was there a, uh, an asphyxiation in the cultural scene of not having space, physical space, but not having cultural space or media space to, to really express themselves. Um, as, as I came to Bologna for the first time, the last, uh, one of the most important uh, alternative spaces in Bologna was closing. Basically, there was a drying up of funding uh, of all the alternative spaces. And I encountered a whole group of, of younger artists and producers very desperate to actually just get anything done in the, in the city. And, uh, and, a, and a generation of older artists who were just very disappointed and kind of had given up and just be, basically will be living in Bologna, but basically will, will travel to other places to do exhibitions and projects. So all these considerations brought me to, to think about this project. And, uh, and I thought about two, um, um, two, two quotes, uh, one by, by Rancière from The Emancipated Spectator about an emancipated uh, community, so a community of translators and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and narrators, and another one by Jelof Yafra, a famous activist who says, don't, don't hate the media, become the media. So in other words, uh, Aile Media, uh, is really an attempt to express like the possibilities and and the ideals of of uh, uh, that of of, of uh, and and the, and the local ingenuity of using uh, media to really create space for oneself as the students of the seventy seven did and the idea was to basically occupy a piazza or piazzas in the in the city with a kiosk that would essentially be a radio station uh, that will broadcast for for a month in the in the city. Uh, well, that will be the ultimate goal. Uh, the idea really was to to create this nomadic structure that would uh, that that would engage the city at that level, but at the same time uh, uh, engage a whole generation of cultural producers. Use use basically the funds of the of the project, which were not very were not very large, uh, to create a social investment. You know, uh, instead of simply creating an exhibition, was really creating uh, the possibility of them seeing themselves using o other kinds of spaces. <clears throat> um, so the, the kiosk itself, uh, but for me, it was important to be, uh, to be very transportable. And it's similar to the School of Pan American. The rest for me, it was important that it will exist in an autonomous fashion. Uh, and I worked with, uh, with a group of young local architects to, uh, to develop the, the project, uh, to, to make it sustainable, to make it recyclable, and, uh, and, uh, and kind of also very visible in the, in the, in the, in the, in the local environment. Um, there was another element of the project that, that to me, was personally interesting, and, um, and uh, what I think, in a way, uh, was very Bolognese. There was, there's a stone in, a, in an old museum in, in Bologna, in the medieval museum, that nobody really knows what actually it means. Uh, it's a, it was discovered in the 1500s, uh, and it's a riddle. And it's called the Stone of Bologna. Um, people had for, kind of forgotten about it. When I went to look for it, it was hiding behind the screen in this medieval museum that no one visits anymore. Um, and uh, what, it, what the stone says, it's essentially a tombstone that describes, the, it's, a, it's a death stone of a woman. Uh, and basically what it says, uh, here lies Alia Lelia Crispis, who is not a man, who is not a woman, who is not androgynous, who was not young, who was not old, uh, who was not cased, chased, was not a whore, but he was all of those things. Who was, who was killed not by a sword, not by poison, by all those things. Not in, the, not in heaven, not in water, not in land, but everywhere she lies. Um, Agatone Pris, Lucio Agatone Prisco, who was not his, her husband, who was not her lover, who was not her father, who was not, who was not happy, who was not sad, who was not crying, he, he does not and does create this, uh, this tombstone for her. Um, and this is a, a stone that, ha that has created an obsession of, over the centuries by many writers like from uh, Stendhal to Carl Jung to ex explain the meaning of what this means. And you, you have to remember that actually in Bologna, that's where Umberto Eco lives. And that's where the name of the rose was written and where Foucault's pendulum was written. So it's, it's a city of enigmas. It's a city of riddles and of intellectual riddles. You know? So I became obsessed with Ale Media and uh, the Radio Alice was the, the 1970s radio station of the students. So we call this Aelia Media. Media, um, in, in, a, in a way to decode the, the, the enigmas of, of, the, of the city, um, in, a, in, a, in a kind of in a funny way, and we we spent uh, well the way we, we started working was uh, uh, inviting um, uh, producers from every kind. You know, we people who, from from movies, from theater, from from visual arts uh, to join us, and uh, we we spent our first uh, workshops in Reggio Emilia, uh, in a in a place where um, 
there, there was a lot of hopefulness and optimism in, in the region of like, uh, as, as is a place that really revolutionized education. Uh, and uh, basically doing uh, uh, numbers of workshops together, you know, trying to learn a little bit more about what it means to collaborate and what it becomes, as the, in, in the uh, Radio Emilia system says, you know, better citizens of the world. Um, and, uh, and then we, we started basically what it was, uh, a summer school, uh, a summer uh, school of uh, radio production. Uh, and you know, I'm not a radio specialist in any way. Uh, I, I basically was learning with them. Uh, we invited artists, from media artists, uh, uh, people who were working from f with, with radio as artists, people who were working with radio as activists, to give us a different sorts of presentations about uh, about what it meant to actually have radio, uh, to create a radio program or to to exist in radio. We we partnered with local radio stations that existed since the 70s uh, that uh, gave us uh, airspace that they could not fill anyway on their own. And, uh, and then we started basically uh, working on each, each one of the group of, the, of producers started uh, creating their own uh, program. And uh, what was interesting to me, and that's another thing that I could not possibly have done on my own, was uh, they were the ones who had the content. Uh, a group of them, be who, who they, know, they knew the city better than, than anybody, and uh, some of them focused on the Bangladeshi immigration, uh, and the other focused on the gay and lesbian culture of Bologna, which is a very rich uh, in Italy. Uh, someone else uh, did a feminist uh, program. Someone else uh, did something specifically about the generation of the 77. Um, and uh, each one had the responsibility of producing their own, uh, their, their own, their own slots. And um, in a way, so this is kind of an example of how you, know, you create a structure within which there's small uh, pockets of autonomy. You know, and, uh, and, and, and yet that everybody is kind of uh, upheld to a certain accountability for what they have to do. Uh, and, uh, and so we opened the project in October of 2011, uh, which also happened to be the moment of the Rome protests, uh, Occupy Rome, in fact, the very day when it all started. And what was interesting about it was that um, you know, this was really a moment where Italians really needed to debate and to reflect about what was going on. And it was really those very important days where that really included the fall of Berlusconi from power and, uh, and really the beginning of, uh, of the Mario Monti uh, tenure. So it, it was kind of an important transitional moment uh, that we happened to be there. And, uh, so again, the, the participatory element included, you know, guests from who, who range from the city government to uh, to other people that like um, the the whole generation. I'm sorry, the generation of the '77. And the, here is uh, Franco Berardi, who is uh, a very famous Italian actor. He lives in Bologna, and he, in fact, was one of the students from the '77 movement uh, who were participating. So there was a really interesting intergenerational dialogue going on uh, uh, as well. And, uh, and it was really an interesting confrontation for the younger uh, activists to really uh, try to, to see themselves in relation to what this other generation had done. And then what happened in the end was uh, quite interesting also that eventually some, some people kind of took over the station. Like these are university students that came and did like this thing. It really has not, nothing to do with us. Uh, and um, so in other words, you, know, you, you build something and suddenly it, like, it starts being intervened. And uh, to me, the, the most uh, exciting part, perhaps, was that uh, the project continues. Uh, I did leave Bologna in the end of 2011, but a group of uh, producers decided to continue the project on their own. And uh, to me, that's, uh, that's maybe like a, one of the most rewarding things. It may not continue forever. It continues in a small way. Uh, they have been looking for their own sources of funding. But I see that many times, what, for those of us who work in this area, um, we, we sometimes uh, need to see that the projects that we do uh, can turn into something else. And, uh, and that just becomes like these, um, this maybe investment in the, in, the, in, the, in the local space that can be really taken on by others. And I just want to finish by, um, I guess, going back to the question about can we save the world, you know? Uh, and I mean, I think it's, it's, it's kind of arrogant almost to, to say, you know, as an artist, you can, I can save the world. Uh, and, uh, but I do think there's a, there's a spirit and a desire for, for many of us who work in this area to, to, to think about what we do in, the, in contributing in, the, in a larger sense that, that, is, that might not be just simply the art market. And I, and I often think about a, uh, a phrase that uh, Albert Camus, said when he received the Nobel Prize, uh, which is, uh, I think it was said in a very different context of the, of the, of the war, of World War II, or the aftermath of that. But I think in a way it applies to us. And the quote is, each generation doubtless feels called upon to reform the world. Mine knows that it will not reform it, 
but its task is perhaps even greater. It consists in preventing the world from destroying itself. Thanks.